All right, you're graduating. Your parents are proud, you're relieved, but now what? Where are you going? How about a college where you won't get overwhelmed and still get the full college experience? Great. Let's start at Rose State. Rose State starts you out with a choice from more than 60 degrees and certificate programs. And Rose State offers compelling value in its two-year degrees. Consider the Rose State graduate feedback in a recent survey. 95% of recent Rose State graduates are employed. 95% would recommend Rose State to a friend. And 97% would get their associate degree if they had to do it all over again. But don't worry. Students at Rose State are so much more than just a number. We'll help you along the way. With smaller class sizes, you can enjoy a hands-on academic lifestyle with a friendly, engaging, and experienced staff. With Oklahoma's first urban community college housing, you can live on campus and enjoy a bustling student life, from sports to an award-winning performing arts center. But at the end of the day, it's all about you and where you want to go. So what are you waiting for? Get started. Rose State College. Going somewhere starts here. All right. Welcome to Great Debates, Power, Politics, and People. With your panelists, and your moderator, James Davenport. Uh, and we know that uh, lots of questions arise about how do reporters and journalists decide what's newsworthy, what should be ran with, what shouldn't, how do they decide what to cover, how much discretion do they have in what they cover. And so hopefully this panel will help us understand those issues as well as talk a little bit about their own perspectives on the quality of journalism that they see uh, today, both uh, locally and, and uh, nationally. Uh, and maybe some insights on how to uh, improve it if they, if they so choose. Uh, I'm very excited about this panel. We have actual journalists to talk about journalism. So uh, what can you say, you know? Uh, that's always a good start. I'm gonna introduce them starting uh, on the nearest me down there. Uh, and we'll probably just go ahead and when it's time for the, each panelist presentation, we'll do it in that order as well, okay? Uh, first up, we have uh, Ms. Laura Eastus. Did I say that right, Eustace? Yes. Uh, who's a news reporter for the Oklahoma Gazette, which is a weekly newspaper serving the Oklahoma City metro area. Uh, she previously served as an education reporter for the Ardmorite in southern Oklahoma and a news reporter for the Elk City in western Oklahoma. Uh, her newspaper career began at the Southwest Times in liberal Kansas, uh, where she covered city and county government. Uh, Laura grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and lives here in Oklahoma City to study journalism at Elon University in North Carolina. So you have been very well traveled. Very nice. All right, next we have uh, Mr. Jason Doyle. Uh, Jason is a contributing editor to the McCarville Report and an afternoon talk show host for News Radio 1000 KTOK. Uh, he is an Oklahoma native who grew up in Union City. He started his media career as an intern uh, with Oklahoma City's KJ103. I remember listening to that growing up. Richie so, Cunningham, yeah. way before almost everybody's time in here. <laughs> uh, he moved to Kansas City uh, and to entertain folks there and inform them. Uh, then do both news and entertainment. Yes, then, right? that's where I made the transition over to uh, news talk. Was All right. 
in the 1990s. He came back to Oklahoma in 2002 uh, and was at KTOK as a news reporter and anchor uh, there for a long time. Uh, he's worked in television and radio newsrooms, including stints at KOC TV and OETA. Uh, Jason's been involved with local radio and television stations in various capacities, including uh, being a political correspondent, business reporter, and content provider across the growing digital and social media platforms for those broadcast stations. Uh, he's an award-winning broadcaster uh, and left corporate media at the end of 2014 to begin working as a freelance writer and media consultant. Uh, today, he writes about energy, business, politics, popular culture, and Oklahoma for various news outlets, including Splurge Ma Magazine. Next, we have Juliana Keeping. Right. Juliana joined the staff of the Oklahoman in 2012. Prior to that, she was a reporter for the Southtown Star in the Chicago area, where she won a Peter, is it Lissacor? Did I say that correctly? Sounds good to me. All right. A Peter Lissacor Award for in-depth reporting uh, on inappropriate spending by local school officials. Next, we have Mr. Trey Savage, who is the editor-in-chief of Nondoc, a journalism and media site based out of Oklahoma City that launched last fall. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Oklahoma. He is also the head bat baseball coach at Harding Charter Prep High School. Did I get that right? Yep. Okay. Uh, and he formerly was the president of Remote Area Medical Oklahoma, which is an organization that provides free medical, dental, and vision care. Uh, he was born in Norman and lives in Oklahoma City. Finally, at the very end, we have our very own Professor Darcy Delaney. Uh, who is currently the professor of mass communications and the advisor for the 15th Street News here at Rose State College. Uh, she began her journalistic career at the age of 13 by submitting stories to her local newspaper. She went on to work for uh, her high school and college newspapers, radio stations, online publications, and campus TV news programs. Uh, professor Delaney earned an associate degree from here at Rose State College and a bachelor's degree in journalism and mass communication with a minor in sociology from the University of Oklahoma, as well as a master's degree from the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication. Uh, while attending undergraduate school at the University of Oklahoma, she was a staff writer at the Sun newspaper in Midwest City, uh, where she worked for three years and contributed to editorial content that included news and feature articles, obituaries, photos, and web content. Uh, Professor Delaney served as a public relations and communication specialist for a software company uh, from 2010 until 2015 and instructed media and English composition courses at the University of Phoenix in Oklahoma City for six years. Please welcome our panelists for today's discussion. As I mentioned, there is uh, no shortage of opinions about the state of journalism, the quality of journalism, whether or not there's bias and what kind of bias in journalism. Uh, and I'm not going to get into any of that. I'm going to let our panelists address those issues, uh, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience, and I'll return uh, when that portion opens. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to you, Laura, to start and kick us off, and uh, when she's completed, we'll just go down the road. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, very excited to speak to you today. And as was mentioned, I work for Oklahoma Gazette here in Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma Gazette is an interesting publication because we're considered an alternative weekly newspaper. So what that means is we are printed once a week and our focus is on arts and entertainment. So being the news writer, that really puts me in a unique perspective because I have a week to work on my stories, but I don't want my stories to be similar to what you might see in the Oklahoman or the Norman transcript because those stories have already been covered. So I can take issues that people are talking about and that people are concerned about and report on them from a different angle or present them in a different light. Also at the Gazette, our focus has always been being uber local. That's a phrase we use around the editorial department. So we want our stories to be local. We want them to be about what's going on, what's happening, what is a concern um, to our readers. And so sometimes what we end up reporting on is stories that you don't see in other publications or covered by other forms of media in our community. So with that said, I haven't done much on presidential elections. As you heard with my um, resume, I've spent a lot of time in smaller communities in Oklahoma. 
And so I've become more of a, a media professional that has consumed this presidential election cycle as opposed to being a part of it in reporting. But I chose that word consumed because I feel like I've consumed more information on this presidential election cycle than any other presidential uh, election we've had before. And to give context, I'm 30 years old. So that means I voted in 2012, 2008, and then 2004. So I'm, I, I don't have a ton to compare it to, but I have gotten my news about the presidential election through Twitter, through Facebook, through watching the nightly news, through conversations with friends over dinner, through even just standing in line at the post office. It's really become a national topic, which I don't feel like I saw that in 2012, 2008, 2004. But I could be wrong. Maybe other people did. <laughs> but I totally right. Okay. Election <laughs> crazy. Yeah. And I'm sure more of the panelists will speak to that as well. Um, but it's, it's also presented, this election cycle has really presented a really unique opportunity for those of us that are consumers of news because we have more ways and different ways to get our information than I think we had in the past. So as I mentioned, with social media, you see people posting about the presidential election, but you also have an opportunity to post about it as well. Find the news stories or the quotes from the candidates that you think are interesting and present that. I think there's some great um, great examples out there of some really good reporting this election cycle that if you're looking for it, you have that opportunity to really dive down into some of the issues that are, that are being talked about that don't get as much national play. Just by Googling something like Ted Cruz and foreign policy, you can very instantly find some news articles to read through. And you can do that with any presidential candidate. Now, with that said, some of the stories that are being shared and being um, more visible out there tend to be some of the conflict that we see in this presidential election or the debates and how they've kind of gotten off the topics and into uh, more kind of catty discussions. <laughs> um, so there's there's that opportunity to, to see the, the the highlights of this election cycle and kind of the down highlights of this election cycle. Um, but I think what I've noticed, in addition to seeing more people consuming this presidential election cycle, is the change in which we've reported on it. Um, I feel like we've taken a very, we've taken this approach to present on this election more like how we cover celebrity news. And I think that that's interesting because if you think about some of the big candidates or the players in this presidential election, in a way they were celebrities before they even signed their forms to run for this uh, presidential office. Uh, obviously Donald Trump is the first example of that, but Hillary Rodham Clinton is a household name from being first lady. A lot of people will always think of her as being the former first lady before they think of her being the senator from New York or the um, secretary of state. Um, Mike Huckabee, who yes, now is out of the election. Uh, a lot of people know him from his radio show. Uh, we also had Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson, who was well known for his work in the medical field as well as a lifetime movie made about his experience and then Jeb Bush is, is a Bush, so he was a household name in the United States. And so I think when it came to covering these candidates, a lot of them already had this celebrity vibe to them. And so we, as the media, we kind of approach them kind of like this entertainment tonight or access Hollywood style reporting. I was at the airport a couple of weeks ago and happened to CNN was on and I was waiting for my flight and the candidates were in New York with the presidential primary the following day. And one of the stories was what they were eating on the campaign trail, which was interesting. I mean, I'm glad to know that they like to stop and enjoy some New York cheesecake, but it really has nothing to do with this election, which I think we've seen that a lot throughout this, this cycle is kind of not just what they're talking about, but kind of what they're eating or what they're doing or, or who's at these campaign rallies and what they're saying and what's on their uh, posters. And so I think sadly, we've kind of reported it more 
on this access Hollywood celebrity type um, way of reporting on our candidates than actually doing some more in-depth reporting on what they're saying about the issues. But that information is definitely out there if you're willing to look for it, if you're willing to visit the New York Times website, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, or even here locally. The Oklahoman did a really great story by Ben Felder in early April where they looked at Oklahoma's delegates and what exactly is this convention and who actually is going from Oklahoma or how that process works. So that information is out there if you choose to consume it. But if you don't want to consume that, you can consume the other part of the presidential election. And what Ted Cruz is saying to Indiana voters today, that's all available for all of us to see. Um, but I would hope as we get closer to this November 8th general election, that we look at including the third parties or the independent parties when we have these debates and these conversations, I think it would be really interesting if we not only had the Democrat and the Republican on stage, but the Green Party candidate or the Libertarian Party candidate. They say, I've heard some polls before from Gallup, that really those debates don't tend to change people's perspective of how they're gonna vote at the polls on November. So why not include some of these other candidates to not just have a debate, but have a discussion and more dialogue about the issues than just having a back and forth of one candidate for this and one candidate against this. And I hope that's something that we can see. It's 2016 and I think it's time that we start looking not just to who the Democrats and the Republicans put up for president, but looking at the other parties as well. Thank you. I think by the looks of it, I'm the only broadcaster up here. So that puts me in a unique position because we get 30 seconds to tell a 15 minute story. I mean, that's kind of the thing with broadcast. You have to be quick, you have to keep going and you can't get in depth. So it leads to the access Hollywood type things because we also have suffered a big deal in uh, from the recession in 2008. Radio and television stations across the country laid off experienced workers experienced journalists all over this country had to figure out, what am I going to do now? All I know how to do is talk into a microphone or smile on the camera and interview and do that thing. What political, uh, really what news, especially broadcast news, has turned into is Anchorman 2. I actually cried at the end of that movie because it's not a parody. It's a satire of what really goes on in a lot of the newsrooms today. Before, when you used to have the big name politicos, and you used to, we used to sit down and have these conversations. And we had the Walter Cronkites and the Murrows and the really big name news guys sitting down with the big name news. Now, we interrupt this program for this latest helicopter chase. And that's really kind of what local news has devolved into. Uh, both on radio and television. It's just what is the latest ambulance chase we can get into. So after 2008, the big mass layoff, you had all this institutional knowledge leave, and then all of a sudden, wait, there's another election year we got to cover, and we don't have anybody to really cover it. And so a lot of local TV stations, because they're, they, get, they pay these consultants to come in and say, hey, people don't want politics. That's boring. They could care less about politics. What they want to find out is what's trending on their phone. And generally what you see is videos that you've seen three days before that producer was able to get it onto the newscast. So with political coverage, these guys are coming in pretty much unarmed. They don't understand, the, uh, especially on the local level. I mean, they joke around about how at 23rd and Lincoln, the uh, state capitol, how the resources have been drained so much. I was just checking, make sure I wasn't boring you. No. Okay. <laughs> so, but the, they've uh, drained the experience so much that these guys don't know what's going on. 23rd and Lincoln is, uh, they're really doing uh, a job on them and basically getting away with a lot of stuff with the press release type journalism. Uh, KWTV9 has made a difference, made a, a change by putting a uh, Capitol correspondent in the Capitol. It's the first non public television correspondent in 25 years to be in the state capitol. So as far as local, and on my radio show, I stress local, local, local politics. I mean, that's one of those things where you make the most difference when it comes to politics on the local level, and you work your way up. 
Uh, and you also get to know the level of politics a little bit better. Um, I'm finding today, with today's presidential election, a lot of people are finding out for the very first time what the process really is. They think, oh, we go to a primary, we vote. They don't realize that, well, delegates are, are selected. And this is how this political fight is going to do uh, uh, turn out. The Republicans have certain rules they're going to follow. Democrats have certain rules they're going to follow. And you hear, oh, wow, we're going to have a contested uh, convention. Political junkie like me absolutely wants to see something like that because I haven't seen something like that in my lifetime. Um, but on the other hand, you've also got a lot of folks that are saying, oh, this country is going to fall to pieces if we have a contested convention and we're going to see riots in Cleveland if Trump doesn't get the nomination, he's the obvious leader. It, and journalists don't know how to cover that today. The young and inexperienced journalists just don't know how to drill down further. And Trump is a showman. He's able to get those type of the type of response he has been able to do because he's in show business. I mean, he knows how to get media's attention. The other candidates, not so much. I mean, you've got uh, perception and reality too. You know, a lot of perception is Dad Cruz is this guy that's oh he's going to be straight. Biblical moralist, and then you got uh, the Trump character who's you know insulting women and minorities and yada yada yada, and then you got uh, you know the guy that's going to give away the country, Bernie Sanders. He's you know, but you find out, wow, Bernie and Hillary, they voted ninety-seven percent of the time the same way. So what's the real big difference on the Democratic side? Even though one of them is an avowed socialist and the other one is pretty much a progressive Democrat. So uh, I guess in today's journalism, in today's uh, broadcast newsrooms, you don't find too many people that know the difference between the two types of Democrats. They don't know what the difference is with the socialist and a, a progressive Democrat. They don't understand that the Republican Party isn't necessarily a conservative party. There are conservatives within that party, but the Republican Party isn't necessarily a conservative party. And trying to break that down into somebody that is used to being able to be a one and done type thing on an apartment fire is really interesting. Um, I, one of my favorite memories being a broadcaster was one of the, uh, there was a big event, I think it, I can't even remember the political issue because it just made me laugh. Uh, sitting there at the Capitol, one of the TV, regular broadcast, ABC, CBS, NBC, local affiliates, somebody showed up how do we get to talk to the legislators? Well, you go over here and you get to sign this little thing and you ask a page to go on the floor and retrieve a legislator. You can do that. I said, did you know you can also set up interviews ahead of time by calling their <laughs> assist? Wow, you mean we have that kind of access to our elected leaders? And that is a degree journalist. So the young folks aren't getting a political education. And that's what I'm really worried about, about the type of coverage we have nowadays. Because most of us, I mean, I love what the print guys do because I consume so much of that myself. I'm a, consu a news consumer. I, and I tell people on my radio show, if you're just getting your news off of radio and television, you're doing yourself a disservice. Get out there and read the things like the Gazette, the Oklahoma, the Nondoc. You're the professor, so I don't, uh, 15th Street uh, publication, you know. Get out there and read and encourage people to read because it's going to give a lot more depth and background to that political, uh, that political uh, issue that you're dealing with. Uh, also, the local papers and the local websites, the microsites, or, or what are we calling it now? Uh, a, a URL? Hyper, hyper local. <laughs> <laughs> it's hyper local uh, coverage. Get, in, get into those because these guys are actually doing some outstanding journalism and they're bringing in. I, I, Nondoc's my my everyday fix. I've got to go to Nondoc. Can we, can can we cut a promo? <laughs> kind of that? I don't know. We'll get to the tech guy. Um, you know, and, and I think the Oklahoma has some fantastic writers. I uh, I'm a big fan of a lot of the writers there, uh, including Juliana and. He got to say that. Yeah, I have I to say that. <laughs> but it's close enough to kick him under the table. So. The, the thing is, today, if you're really relying on radio and television to give you your political news, go and get that extra, get into that reading material. The radio and television can bring a lot of great attention to issues, but if you really want to discover what the real issue is, 
go to the print journalism, go to the print, uh, digital guys, because they're going to have the space and the time to really put things together. Not that I don't love radio and television. I absolutely do. That's the reason why I left my own business to go back into radio. But it's important for people to understand you're only going to get that 30-second package as opposed to a good 500 words that can make a whole lot of difference in your understanding of how politics runs. Lori <laughs> says, Jason Bill is the president, everybody. <laughs> that was great. Okay, so anyway, I'm Juliana Keeping. I'm a reporter for the Oklahoman, and I'll tell you something about how I operate within my organization. I'm an enterprise reporter, and that's just a vague, crazy word. So um, what it means is I explain things. I look for context and trends. And so that's my challenge is when I do enterprise reporting to um, try to, you know, get beyond all the knee jerk stuff that these guys are referencing and um, to the best of my ability, you know, provide the context. That's that's my ultimate goal. And, um, you know, Jason mentioned that um, news organizations are have been suffering. Absolutely. We've gone through so many so many layoffs since the economic collapse and even before, but it's accelerated. So we're all really challenged, um, but we're up for the challenge. We work really hard at the Oklahoman uh, to, to keep the quality of our news coverage high. Um, part of what I do besides looking for these in-depth projects, which are incredibly time consuming, I mean, I might put out like a giant narrative piece, like one a year, you know, an investigative thing, hopefully once a quarter. And then beyond that, I'm also doing uh, like shorter trend stories, and just covering the general news as it comes up. So we all have to be generalists, at least at my organization. Um, but in addition to that, um, so obviously print's going down. Uh, the circulation's been going down for a while as reader habits change. <laughs> there was the internet, but now it's really mobile that's come up and um, shaken things up. So part of my job as well is to identify how, how can I serve our mobile readership? Because they have different habits than the print reader and even the you know desktop reader to an extent. Um, everyone's Everything's going to the phone. So I don't want to write clickbait trash. <laughs> Personally, I don't think I can live with that. So how do I cover um, political events without, you know, turning it into just, you know, crap, for lack of a better term? Um, that's been my challenge. Like, um, my mobile team, we will, we, we cover different debates. And I mean, I can, if we have a discussion, I can get into more. But um, so like, in covering the debates, turning an article, what I do is turn an article um, debate coverage into something that's consumable for a mobile reader, but hopefully still provides some context and interest. So if, you, if you've missed the debate, you know, you can, you can get a summary from this article that you're probably going to read on your phone. And then I also will live cover it with Twitter and stuff like that. Um, so that's something a little different we can probably get into later. But other than that, um, there's politics in everything I cover, whether or not it's obvious. If I'm, if we're investigating something, it's there's going to be some overlap in politics and policy, and uh, it just always seems to come up. And that's our job too, to be watchdogs of the government. So it's one of the core tenets of the press, um, and I want to keep it strong. And I'm gonna pass it to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I, I'm happy to talk about whatever else as we go on. But yeah. Oh, sure, perfect. I, I'm going to try to be quick because I think actually there, I feel like we all probably want to say things, you know, in a, in a group conversation. Uh, I'm Trey Savage, uh, editor-in-chief of nondoc.com, N-O-N-D-O-C.com. Uh, it may say William W. Savage III on my byline, or it does. I don't know what it says here. Um, but that, uh, that had always been my byline back when I was working at the Norma Transcript uh, and at the OU uh, newspaper in college where I was the editor and then at, at eCapital.net, which is a um, uh, a legislation tracking service and uh, news organization at the state capitol. I met Jason. We sat next to each other, so we're more familiar with each other than we probably want to be probably. at 8 a.m. on a, <laughs> spending 16 hours in a row together or something like that. Um, Sunny die. So we started nondoc.com uh, on September 1st uh, of last uh, year, and um, we're about, I guess, eight months nearly in now, uh, which is amazing. Um, and one of the things we really tried to do is, is be a little different. Um, and, and I'm going to get to that in terms of how we approach political coverage. Uh, I had really good advice from a, a professor at OU named uh, Warren Beat, who's a, a wonderful reporter, experienced reporter himself. Um, and he kind of said, you know, be, be something that, 
you know, don't make sure you're not duplicating what other people are doing. Uh, and I thought that was really important. Now, we kind of didn't really know exactly how we were going to do that, but we tried to do some different things. So I'll give you two or three things that we do a little differently than I think other people do. We, we made a bet on credibility and uh, sort of old school journalism ethics in a digital world. Now, if you tell a bunch of people that, um, that no one's going to like buy you a drink at the bar or, you know, go home with you if that's what you rule out. Based on like, it's not a sexy thing to be like, we're going to be, you know, what's going to make our site awesome? Credibility. <laughs> and people are like, okay, great, you know. But we figured in the long run um, that sort of sticking to the uh, uh, things that, that I've learned in, in journalism school, uh, like Juliana's organization does, like Laura's organization does, you know, like all the places you've worked do, Jason. Yeah, um, I'm, you know, I'm that guy. That, I'm that guy. <laughs> right. Well, that, that we would would benefit versus being another blog that has a political slant that doesn't disclose potential conflicts of interest. That, you know, I, I mentioned. I think I said in my bio. I coach baseball, Harding Charter Prep. Well, Tom Cole's going to be there tomorrow, so we're going to kind of do a story. I'm trying to get a guy, a, a student there, to write a piece for us. We'll see if that turns into disaster. Who knows? Um, and never, never put a high school student on deadline. I'm going to guess is my lesson to take away from that. But uh, you know, we'll put an editor's note at the bottom and say I coach high school baseball at Harding Charter Prep. Not because anybody's going to call us on it and be like you're being slanted in your coverage of it, but because because the point is transparency is to to say that that yes, I'm the editor of that site and I get two hundred dollars a month uh, from you know this school to coach their baseball team just to try to be above reproach in that regard. And I, I think that um, there was some stuff that came out recently about how George Stephanopoulos still has some ties to the Clintons. And there's there's just a lot of things where people uh, have gotten away from being transparent fully in, in media. And I think that's really important because people can make their own, own decision that way. Um, and it sort of insulates you from some of the criticism because everybody has a uh, a, a background. I should say that non-doc is short for non-doctrine or non-doctrinaire, which we took from a, a Walter Cronkite quote. Uh, it's on our website. You can go read the whole quote. But he basically talked about how a journalist should be a, 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 a liberal in the classical sense of the word where you don't have a doctrine, where you, you're sort of skeptical and you go into any situation, you know, approaching it fairly. And we, we try to do that. The other thing we do that we try to set ourselves apart from is we label commentary versus news. And so if you go to our site, anything that says commentary, it has a drop cap and bolded first three or four words, and it has a bar that says commentary on it, meaning that that's the author's opinion. So I had Jason write me a piece on why he supports civil asset forfeiture reform, right? And so he writes that piece, and it's just his opinion on it. Well, that's different than if I have the good fortune to pay Juliana $100 to freelance um, to you know write a piece about... Um, you know, teacher salaries across the state or something like that, right? And she does interviews and all that sort of stuff. We only are actually able to pay right now for freelance reporting. We don't pay for commentary. And that's kind of worked out well for our budget, but it also works out well in terms of, you know, what's the old saying? Everybody's got an elbow. Opinions are like your whatever, right? So everybody's got one. It's hard to do classical reporting. It really is. So we kind of try to emphasize that, and we try to designate commentary because it drives me crazy where people are like, well, uh, you know, that, that, that article's slanted. Well, it's an opinion piece, you know, and, and so we try to take that and label an opinion piece an opinion piece, and that's a small thing, but, you know, really there's not a whole lot of people classically doing that in, in digital media that we see. Um, so I say all that to lead to the political coverage. There's a, we're also not actually, we try to be hyper-local, like our advertisers would like it if we were more hyper-local, right? But we, we intentionally think it's kind of cool that we've created a literal international publication. Um, you know, within the last two weeks, we're going to have published pieces from people who are, some of it's poetry that we do on the weekend, stuff like that, but who are in India, who uh, the United Arab Emirates or Dubai, um, uh, South Africa, and uh, we got hit up by a, a, a feminist poet in Iraq um, who wants to run some of her stuff, and that's such a cool thing that we're actually going to run her pieces and try to do a piece on her, you know, tie it together because that sounds like a great story to tell, right? Um, so we, we were very happy that, you know, I've never met uh, one of those people I knew before we started the site. So we try to be not just local because in a global world, I think we're all, you know, who, who's not from Oklahoma in this room? Okay. So we've got several people who, who right now just have inherent interests in places that aren't Oklahoma City. So for us to just say Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City, we intentionally didn't put that in our, in our URL on our name or anything like that because we, we figure it's a, it's a regional, a world world uh, marketplace now. 
uh, which again, advertising wise, probably isn't the smartest decision. So I, I know I said I'd be short, and I'm going to try to wrap this up. In, when we did polit have done political coverage, um, you did, I, I think if you've never read it, um, I would really advise everybody to go out and get on Amazon and buy a $6 used copy of Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 1972 by Hunter Thompson. It was got, what got me interested in politics back when I was in high school um, and, and read it or called it, maybe it was. Um, and he, now, that piece you have to take with a grain of salt because there's some, it's, it's not a traditional reporting kind of, it sort of reports a lot on the circus of people following candidates around and then of course, uh, Ed Muskie was not really on IPA game, um, you know, and all those sorts of things that are in it. That's a, you have to read the book. But my point being, like, so he sort of fudges the truth and he becomes a scene. He gets thrown off this bus at this one point. And, and so, he, but he was reporting for Rolling Stone magazine. But the thing I liked about that and that I personally took into our campaign coverage, because I think, I think policy coverage, coverage of the legislature is a little different than, than campaign coverage. When the first campaign piece we did, we tried to do a, a big coverage of every time a candidate came. So Donald Trump was the first big one in September when we launched. And then I believe it was Hillary Clinton and then Ted Cruz and then Bernie Sanders and then uh, Marco Rubio and all that. But we decided to do, I decided to do them as commentaries. Um, you know, I'm the editor of the site, but certainly starting off, you know, it was, it was all hands on deck. I, I not only had to be the editor, but I was covering these events. We decided, I decided to write them as commentaries. I'm going to go out and I'm going to explain my experience uh, of going to a Trump rally, of being in the media area, talking with media, put, because media, I think, are part of the story. Um, because, you know, and, and Donald Trump is so artful with that. He turns the camera around, or he tells, he tells the, the, the press area to turn the camera around on themselves. He's like, you're all terrible people. You know, he's yelling at the me and media, or, you know, going back and forth, and, and they're part of the game. And I think they're just as big a part of the game. So I really went with the intention of how do I write about what's going on behind the scenes? And I'll probably talk more about it later. Some of that comes from I've worked a little bit in politics. But I, we tried to take that slightly different approach because, well, everybody's going to send a, a stringer to write a, a story. The AP is going to have a story. The Oklahoma is going to have a story. The world's going to have a story, that sort of stuff. But who's going to sit there and use I, first person, and talk about, you know, this is what happened. This is who I, what I saw. When I pulled up to the parking lot, this is what I saw. That's really hard to write from a classical third person standpoint. So we kind of took that role about it. Um, you can look it up on nondoc.com if you want to judge for yourself. But yeah, that's kind of what I got. So we'll go from there. Well, my job is to train journalists. So, you know, it's a little uh, you know, concerning to hear people talk about, you know, how it is problematic. Um, and, and not in legacy journalism is kind of the dying breed, and I think that's what's so sad about it. Um, but I really love legacy journalists, and that's what I want uh, my students to take away from it is to try to implement that into the new world, like how you were talking about. Um, but we had this discussion this morning in class about transparency and bias and. And we were talking about CNN specifically because they have all the um, Amanda Carpenters and all these people who represent campaigns who have done speech writing and um, for, for the different candidates. And so you look at that and you say, okay, why are they on there? What, what kind of political expert are they? Um, but one of the students said, well, everyone has bias. I would rather know what their bias is going into it. And so you're talking about transparency, and I think that's really important. Um, but when do we use it, when do we not? When do we try to find a political analyst who actually you don't know their, where, they, where their biases lie, and you don't know um, what their political affiliation is? Um, you don't have to go off of local television to see that. That, that happens very frequently here in this market. Yeah. Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no. Bobby Stem is regularly used on Box 25 as a political analyst. He's a contract lobbyist. He has between 10 and 20 contract lobby, contracts to lobby for a specific viewpoint at any one time. And so what do they what do they refer to him as? As, as a Fox News political analyst. Yeah. And and you know, I think that that's I think that's very unethical. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead. No, and, and that's one of the things. I mean, Media Ethics Week was last week, right? So like we need to think about how we're representing ourselves. Um, but transparency, bias, um, we talked about conflict zones, um, 
you know, CNN comes on and they have like the, it looks like a boxing match with their photos, you know, and they're throwing it out there like it's an MMA fight. And you're like, you know, when did it become this? When did, when did it become this? And so thinking about how we represent things and the students went out and they, they covered Rubio Trump, um, Sanders rally, uh, Ted Cruz rally. They, they went and covered those. And they did try to cover it from a third person perspective. And they were they were having to show the protesters out in the parking lot and, and to describe that without being able to describe it in first person. Right. But um, it was really challenging for them, especially um, I had uh, one of my students, she's um, Hispanic. She went out and covered Trump when he came to the state fair. And uh, she she had obvious bias um, going into it, but she said it was the best lesson she could have learned is to try to write from a perspective. Um, so trying to trying to show that to students and, and trying to take away their their a little bit of their individuality there, <laughs> but also you know uh, have them have them report fairly is, is really difficult. But I think they're doing a good job. And it's it's something that I think we should strive to do, even if they don't end up even if they end up writing commentary. I think that they should strive to, to start out that way. Sure, that was great. Toss it back and forth. Oh, James no. has more, more <laughs> structure. Dad, Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Left to our own devices, it'll be just yeah, it you knock yeah. jokes and right. open record discussions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm, that that could take the whole panel on itself. From um, we want to open it up to questions from from people in the audience. Uh, if you are a student and you have a question, be sure to announce your your name to the panel before you uh, and then ask your question. Uh, and then, uh, in addition, I'm going to start, though, with uh, Dr. Hotrick. Dr. Hotrick is one of our history faculty here at Rose State and has uh, attended today, so I'm going to let him be the lead-off question. Uh, I have a question for all of you. Um, I've lived here for, I guess, 25 years now. I'm not originally from here. Uh, I do read the Oklahoma uh, on a daily basis. I read the Gazette. Uh, I don't listen to local talk radio. Uh, what I, I mean, I'm familiar with it. Uh, I have friends that do. Uh, however, <laughs> don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but what strikes me, you know, we're talking about a lack of bias in, in, in journalism and media coverage. I always get this um, uneasy feeling uh, when I'm reading the Oklahoma that I'm getting one perspective, oftentimes uh, dealing with an enormous array of issues. Um, and I understand that journalism, like any product, it, it's, it's consumer-driven. Uh, radio, local radio, I mean, obviously, you know, KTOK has high rankings because people listen to the show. But at the same time, I, I always have this uneasy feeling every now and then that I'm, I'm living almost like in some kind of a, a totalitarian state where there's this constant stream of one perspective, once, you know, we have guest editorials in the Oklahoma. I mean, George Will is in the, in the editorial section almost on a weekly basis. And I, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that, that maybe sometimes in some places the market is driving journalism and it's not allowing people to really get multiple perspectives, unbiased perspectives. Um, what are your thoughts about about that? And I think it, it occurs with all media nowadays. Sure, I'll take that since I'm kind of repping the Oklahoma. So you're talking about the, the editorial page, or are you talking, talking about, about the news? entire paper? Period. I mean, anytime you ever read anything about Obama, it's negative. Anytime you ever read about this, that, or the other, it's negative. We're in an economic, you know, downturn currently. I haven't read anything. It just says, well, it's a downturn in the oil and gas industry. I haven't read anything about maybe it's some some of it has to do with Governor Fallon's policies because the Oklahoma, I mean, I know the Gaylord family, they're not, I, I just get a sense that there's a lot of bias in, in that paper. And, and I don't think it's alone in the country because, I mean, I'm a historian, I'm a history yeah. professor. One of the problems I deal with is there's an enormous amount of liberal bias in history survey books, not monographs. The history survey books, and and I'm very uneasy. I, mean, I try not to instruct my students. I don't want them to know my political opinion about anything. I try to give them these are the facts, 
form your own opinions. And I don't get the sense that the media in the state really adheres to that kind of effort. Right. Well, I would only encourage you to, you know, try to participate if you can. I mean, it's it's not a lost cause. We want to hear from our consumers about what you want, you know, and what you're not getting as a consumer of news. I mean, we are, this is an extremely conservative news outlet. I mean, hello, we put a, we put a prayer on the front page of the paper. I think we're the last country in America to do this, okay? <laughs> like, there's no getting around it. So, but the Gaylords, they sold us now. We're owned by Philip Anschutz. You know, yeah, he's a Colorado oil billionaire. Um, but if, you know, so, you know, you, like, you can, like, I used to touch on this point. If you don't see a certain type of coverage in, an, in a newspaper or on a website, yeah, that's an example of bias. And, you know, as a news consumer, I would just encourage you to let the powers of be know that, let, or let the powers that be know, you know, you're not okay with that. You want to see more and to participate in the process. And I don't know, like, if you're talking about a specific article, like our energy coverage, or you don't like our editorial, no, or you want to just, see more you know, I've, I've taken the paper for 25 years. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's a just conservative outlet. It's just consistently slanted in one direction. Yeah, like, see, I see, I hear that, and I, I understand where you're coming from and everything like that, but I can, I can say I've never, as a reporter, once had anyone, like a, you know, the arm of Ann shoots like, yeah. <laughs> come down and turn my computer off, or or mess with my story or what have you. Sure. And, um, you know, I try to cover criminal justice, civil rights issues, history. I try to cover Native Americans, um, little heard voices, you know, just, I try to cover a diverse array of subjects, um, you know, because I think that Oklahoma is a lot more diverse than I thought when I, coming down here from the Midwest. Um, and so me as a reporter, you know, I try to reflect the diversity of the, my community. But if you're not seeing like that, all, that all I can say is, you know, go to our, write letters to the editor, oh, arrange meetings, you oh, know. Nobody ever gets back. Write a piece of a commentary on our site uh, talking about the issues. <laughs> no, uh, so Participate. You know? I, I think you did. No, I mean, I'm serious. We One of the things we try to do is we try to offer media perspectives because these are discussions that are important. And um, I, I think that, that Julian is right, is that, you know, for the vast majority of the situation, I think the reporters uh, and, and editors there have a pretty good ability to 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 have the freedom to do the journalism they want to do. Now, when the the tax the sales tax was up for the uh, uh, Thunderdome, you know, to, to when the thunder was coming here, I mean, it was widely reported that the editorial uh, that, the, that the company said, "Do not write negatively about this book." Um, now that I mean, that's it was. Sent around the emails are around on the internet, you know. So knowing that, and 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 of course, the Oklahoma was named the worst paper in the United States in what 1993 or something like that. Things so, have changed a lot, right? Right. right no. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm saying that. Yeah, things have changed because I I I'm I'm very confident that someone or some group of people who are in the ownership or are in the editorial system or whatever began to recognize that if if what you just said continues to be the public perception, you're going to lose 40%, 50% of your possible readership. If, if, even if it's not true, what you just said, if that's what the perception is, that's more important than what the reality is, right? So I know for a fact that the Oklahoman has made a very concerted effort to increase the quality. They've reinvested in quantity. The thing that nearly killed the Oklahoman was what? You might remember? Like financially, nearly bankrupted the company. It's called Wimgo. Uh, Where I'm going, right? And it was back when we were just getting into the, the internet world. I mean, they invested a lot of money. My perception is that the company has invested a lot of resources back into, or a, a lot of focus back into enabling good reporters like Juliana to do her job. But the perception still it, exists, and and sometimes. There are things done by a publication like that that are, are totally out of the hands of the editorial department at all. And, and to the point where if I were in the world, I, would, I couldn't handle it. I'll give you an example. When Ann Schutz bought the newspaper in, what, 2014, I believe it was? No, I'm sorry. It was no, 2012. Right. It was 2012 because of the story Mary had told. One of the first major things he did, he said, I don't want to meddle in the editorial stuff or wrong. And he's, by the way, this guy doesn't do interviews. I don't know if he hadn't done an interview for like 25 years until he did one a couple years ago, I think it was. They put an insert into the newspaper 
that was uh, printed, and it didn't even say advertisement on it, but it was printed and it was put into all his newspapers across the country, and it was a Mitt Romney for President advertisement, a 12-page piece that had headlines that said, Barack Obama is the problem, and blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. That had nothing to, Juliana, or her editor, or the editor-in-chief, had nothing to do with that. The editorial department would have nothing to do with that. But ownership does something like that, and boy, does that affect the public perception, right? So even where on a very small, fledgling site like ours, we have to be like that ourselves in terms of what are we doing on an ad basis? What are we doing on a promotional basis? How, how are our smallest decisions on a non-editorial factor perceived by the public potentially? And that's very hard to do. And, and so I think, I guess I'm trying to defend the Oklahoman journalists uh, by pointing out that sometimes ownership and people like that will make decisions that don't jive with the heart and the credibility and ethics of the journalists themselves. That's maybe more what I'm referencing, not individual reporters. I do read a lot of good articles, but anytime there's any kind of commentary pieces, it's just it's one perspective. I mean, it's like it's like again, like I always get this uneasy feeling: state sanctioned party line, and there's no room for any kind of nuance. It's like KPOK, at least that I'm aware of, mostly conservative. You've got Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck. It's just a steady stream of you know, wah 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 wah. And I understand it's market driven, but it doesn't allow for any kind of unless you go to other sites. And, and that's our option, obviously. But it just seems like it just seems like Radio America. Or like I, I'm with you. I don't. Well, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I think that this is a, a it's a relatively new concept that we that we expect our media to be unbiased. I mean, in the grand history of, of publication, you know, it's only 50, 60, 70 years ago that you know, well, they a, ran out first. Yeah, you know, right. Before that, if you, I mean, you go to the Oklahoma History Center and you can look at all the papers are either called the Johnston County Democrat, which is still a paper, or the Watonga Republican, which is still a paper. You know, those are holdovers from a time when every publication had Democrat or Republican in the title. Well, I think of the endorsements as well from papers. You know, how did, how sure. did you know, respond to that? Oh, see, and I like to play with the bias that you're talking about. One of the things that I, when they threw me the keys to my show, they said, all right, so what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I'm not an angry white guy. So what am I supposed to do? You know, <laughs> I mean, if that's what you're telling me is successful in radio, then I guess I don't know what to do. What to do. But I've been number one at every radio station with the exception of what I've been at. Um, I like to poke the bear. They're, one, they're all launch a liberal grenade right in the middle of my audience to get them mad, to get them going. I love it. One of my favorite things to say is, I love my liberal friends. And I, will, I try to encourage more of a conversation, especially on the local level, than, it, than I do with what Beck and Hannity and Rush tried to do. They're the national guys. They, they've got that down. They've got that show down. My show is nothing like theirs. What are you on? If well, what five to right? seven, five to seven, five. we have podcasts at KTOK as well. That'll be interview segments. But my my emphasis is more local. I you got nine hours of national talk before I come on the air. And so why should I repeat what they're saying? Or because my opinions may or may not fall in line with theirs. However, what's more inter interesting to me is the local scene. I love the fact that I am banned from UConn right now because I've been banging the city of UConn for missing out on $1.3 million in a bond issue. They don't know where it went. And I called the city council a bunch of ribbon cutters instead of doing their job. You know, that's what local media is supposed to do as far as hel uh, holding somebody. And I'm no longer a journalist. I don't consider myself a journalist. When I was a journalist, I used to get <laughs> approached by Republicans and Democrats at the uh, Capitol, and both of them to the D. You're on their side, okay. which I meant I was doing the right job because nobody liked me. I mean, <laughs> uh, but the thing is, is now that I've got to go to the other side and actually opine and really kind of put down thought leadership, I change the point of view. It's not necessarily a red or a blue thing for me. It's what can you do to make a difference if you're so impassioned about that point? 
And like I said, we are, we give, there's two things I stress on my show. One, we are the people that give the consent to be governed. So we are in control of this government. And if we don't practice that empowerment of the government, we'll be ruled. Second, go local first. This whole national thing, it's great. I love the fact that we've got Trump in this race and it's created this chaos and nobody can figure it out. I absolutely, I'm eating this stuff up. However, it really doesn't make a difference too much now that the primary is over in, in Oklahoma and we're not really going to be involved in this type of stuff until November. You know, so. Not even then, really. But yeah, because, I, I mean, mean yeah. Neither, no one's going to campaign in, in November here. Pretty much. I mean, because we're that red state. I, it's, it's, I get that. I get that whole perception with KTOK, especially with the amount of conservative programming that we've got. But it's it's been working on a national level for so long. They continue to do it. But if you start to listen to some of the major cities and listen to their local shows, they're sounding more like me than they are sounding like Rush or Hannity or back nowadays. So give the local radio guys a little bit of, of shot. Even my competition, Chad Alexander in the afternoons. Uh, Scott Mitchell in the mornings, my compatriot Lee Matthews in the in the mornings for KTOK. Listen to those guys. Uh, it, yeah, this, it, <laughs> right, right. And I do the same thing. I mean, I don't get to consume the broadcast journalism that I like to. In fact, I can't remember the last time I watched a local newscast. I'd rather go to the website, and if there's an interesting video, I'd, I'll click on it and see it from there, because they pretty much dice up their newscast and throw it up on the website. Well, thanks, you guys. Let me let let some of the students. Uh, before we go, we've got a question from one of our online viewers. But before we go to that, uh, we had uh, someone over here. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'd like to open this for for everybody, but uh, just based off something Ms. East has uh, said in her statements, um, do you see a lack of focus on issues to be a continuing trend in the media, and how, in a society obsessed with entertainment, can we bring focus back to the real issues? Well. I'll go ahead and answer that first. Um, we've kind of already, I, I think, touched on this a little bit, at least one of the other panelists, about sound bits, um, sound bites. It's hard to present a foreign policy plan in 30 seconds that's being presented by a presidential candidate. But it's really easy to say they presented this plan and they're going to make America great again. That's that's really easy to broadcast and get out there. And that's unfortunate, though, because um, some of the issues that our nation faces uh, can't be it can't be a 15 second, 30 second piece. It's, it's and even a 500 word story. Really, I've written a lot of 500 word stories. And I've written a lot of 2000 word stories and I still am leaving out parts because I, you know, have a space. Uh, crunch situation. Um, I would like to see more people get more interested in these issues, but I don't know how we're going to do that when we continue to have people more interested in uh, uh, the controversy or the, uh, uh, you know, going back and forth on candidates' wives. Um, I, we have a $18.1 trillion dollar budget or a trillion dollar deficit, and I think that's only come up in one of the Republican debates. And if I remember this correctly, Rubio had the best answer, and he's not even in the race anymore. And um, it's really unfortunate. I think as consumers of the media, we need to demand if we want to see that. But how many of us are going to be willing to write letters to the editor or uh, leave messages on Facebook uh, to media outlets that we want to see those kind of stories? Add something? Sure. So she's talking about from the consumer perspective, but I'll just give you like a reporter's point of view. Um, I've covered, as far as the national politics, like we're a real red state. So we've get, we got some re Republicans and we had Bernie Sanders randomly visit, which was really cool. I got to cover that. But anyway, um, one thing I think that we can do as reporters is just, uh, and it's hard because I've tried to do it, is just like double down on the accountability and do not, and it is almost impossible, but do not let them just go off on their bullet points because this is what every single politician who's like that high level, national level, this is what they've done. Like Ted Cruz held this press scrum, which I hate. It's like everyone stands around with their cameras, you know, and they're all shouting over each other. It's like the worst place for discussion ever. 
But I'm like, all right, I always try to throw a question in um, if I can get a chance. I'm yelling over people. It's so rude. I hate it, but I do it anyway. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, all right, so he's he's big on repealing Obamacare. Well, part of Obamacare is pr the protections that offered for people with pre-existing conditions, um, which was just this, you know, I can't believe that was part of our history that people with these medical conditions, you know, would not be covered by the insurance plans they pay for. Anyway, so I'm like, all right, well, what's your plan? Specifically, I said, for children born with pre-existing conditions, because you just had this line about kids and all that. I'm like, oh, speaking of children, how about children who are born with illness? Like, what happens to them if you repeal Obamacare? And he just, he started talking his bullet points. And I said, no, sir. I said, you, you're, I, that's not what I asked you. I asked you specifically what happens to children with disease if you repeal Obamacare? Are they going to be covered by their insurers? Again, second time, I, or first time. Yeah, I interrupted him twice. He never answered my question. He cut me off. Um, he just said, I'm not under interrogation, ma'am. You're done. Next question. And so I tried. But I really got a sense. I, I got a real sense of how hard it is to get answers from these people. And we have to, I mean, I think that now looking back, I should have just kept shouting. I mean, it's like, and maybe a veteran reporter. I'm not like a veteran. You know, I'm not a newbie, but I'm not a, you know, like 30 year, 20 year vet either. I'm so... Like a veteran reporter, they may not have even bothered. I mean, you talk about millennials, and mm -hmm. um, but also veteran reporters. They might, they just might be so jaded. Like, forget it. They know the Republican Party has no answer. Was this an OCCC? Uh, I think so. I was in traffic, so I didn't even get there before. <laughs> so no, but that's how. I'm really is. like, I'm really, I never heard that that exchange. I because that would have been because that's why I wanted to write first person on that thing is because it's I wanted incredible. to describe that it's interaction. It's incredible the way they don't answer questions, but to be. To be fair, I, Bernie Sanders, I cover Bernie Sanders rally. I get word the very last minute that we're going to get an interview. I have like five minutes to prepare, you know, but this is a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm like, okay, this will be better. Bernie Sanders, I asked him, what am I going to ask? I ask about veteran issues, and I try to ask a specific question. Now, his manner is different, but he's the same, okay, because he, he, repeat, he repeats my question to me, and I'm thinking, oh, man, this guy's really, like, listening to me, but... Then he's also just not answering the question. He's just doing it in a way cooler way. And they're all the same. So like, you need to push so much harder, like as reporters, and be confrontational. And like, you know, especially younger reporters who you know, maybe grew up on their phones. You know, I'm old enough where I didn't. We're like, oh, we don't confront people face to face. Practice confronting people face to face and yelling over and demanding and don't let them slide. And so that's as far as like, how can we regain focus? I mean, push, you know, be brave, yell, get answers, because the politicians are walking all over us. It's a joke. So no, that's, that's, my, that's, that's, my, yeah. that's my little two cents with my limited experience. Of the <laughs> no, that's good. Um, look, I'll just say this from our perspective at Nanda, or our experience at Nanda. Um, what, what she's saying is, is terrific, but if I had been there and written up that, and it, it, it wouldn't have necessarily done any better in terms of the clicks we got than, than what anything else with it. We run, um, or I'll, I'll tell you this, we started September 1st, our best day ever on terms of site traffic, which is how we help get our traffic up to get ads and, and, and cash flow on thing, was when we have a, we have a writer who's done some pieces uh, about the city of Tishomingo, where Blake Shelton uh, lived with Miranda Lambert, and She's that from there. I went to college with her. She's an excellent writer. She could have worked at the New York Times. She didn't. She chose to stay in Oklahoma, um, be with her family. And so she's done some freelance stuff for us. And she happened to be in a Mexican restaurant uh, when Blake Shelton brought Gwen Stefani uh, to Tishomingo right around Christmas. So she posted something on Facebook, and I was like, hey, will you write us up a um, you know, 300 words about this. 300 words is the minimum we need for search engine optimization, right? Uh, to help you make sure you get your, so you put uh, Gwen Stefani as your your keyword and then that people search Gwen Stefani and they see your thing, right? So that piece got, I, I, don't, I don't remember the number, but it basically got 25, excuse me, 25 to 30 times as many clicks as at that time we were normally getting in a given day. Like in one day, 25 times as many clicks as anything else. It was it was probably the worst and most useless 300 words we've published on the site to this date, right? And it got linked by People Magazine, and we got you know thousands and thousands and thousands of clicks out of it. Meanwhile, 
every Friday we run a piece that we refer to as uh, WTF versus FTW, which is, I'll let you, you know the first one, the white second one's face. for the win, right, a white <laughs> face. And so, and it's about the legislature. Talk, we highlight three or, two or three things that are kind of WTF, and then two or three things that are like, for the win, you know, something good happened. Like they actually did a, a, something positive, right? And we just kind of, you know, some, make synopses of that stuff. And that really doesn't get a whole lot of clicks. And I was even talking to our managing editor, Josh McPhee, who does it. And he was just saying, he was like, I, you know, he's like, I feel that I, I need to keep doing this because this is the sort of thing our site should do. Even though it doesn't get the response from the public that we would hope for, or that maybe would be good for us statistically. He, he's like, this is what we should be doing. So we're going to keep doing it. And so now we've just got to figure out a way to like, if WTF doesn't get you to click in the headline, I don't know what we're going to do to get the, the you know clicks to it to get people to actually pay attention to what was going on in the legislature when they want to just read about Gwen Stefani or something like that. Because you talk about the cult of personality, Absolutely. celebrity culture. It's, let's, let's go to our, one of our online question. Terry Parker from Midwest City asks, as a person desiring to be involved in local and state level government, what do you recommend as a potential official and or candidate to create a positive impact in press and media? Also, what is something you as professionals would like to see from candidates and officials? Answer the phone. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, something. I had two candidates this year. Two, well, the two, uh, the two special elections we had, one in the House, one in the uh, Senate that surprised everybody because these were long time held Republican seats and the Democrats won. When both instances, the Republican did not call the media back, yeah. would not respond yeah. to the media. In the meantime, Democrats, no problem. They were right there in front of it. I've always said Democrats tend to have a bit better of PR than Republicans do. But if you're going to be a candidate and you want to get your name out there and you don't have some kind of shtick like a Trump or, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of a local candidate that's kind of Richard Morissette. Richard Morissette. Yeah, Richard Morissette. He's decided as a legislator to run for corporation commission. He's term limited out, but he's taken on the earthquake issue. So focus on an issue that might affect your community, but talk to the media. Do not be shy from the media. They're, we're going to ask you tough questions. And as long as you're honest, we're going to be we're going to print what you're what you're saying, or we're going to talk about what you're saying. That guy, but, David McLean, is the Republican Senate candidate he was talking about in Owasso who's a well-known pastor in the area or whatever. And yeah, he would not reply. We were trying to ask five questions of both candidates, you know, a week or so, two weeks before the campaign. And we Facebook messaged him, emailed him, had his phone number, called, left his messages, texted him, everything. And we could not get them to even acknowledge that we were trying to send them five basic questions. And one of them was like, you know, uh, what's the state of education in, in, whatever freaking county that was, you know, what, like what, you know, tell us about, it was basic stuff, just, just basic stuff. And they wouldn't respond and, 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 and the guy lost and, and, you know, I'm unbiased in the issue. I'm not rooting for the other guy, but I was like, yeah, serves you right, dude. Like that's what you get. I would say also contact information. I've been to candidates sites before in the mm -hmm. hopes of setting up an interview or uh, connecting with them, and I can't find an email address or a phone number easily. Even on the contact me page, it'll be like one of those forms, and I'll fill those out. You know, Laura used to, you know, media requests. I'm being transparent and presenting myself, and I also have not gotten replies. So I'm like, did you not get the email that on your site, this is how you want people to contact you, or are you just choosing to ignore me? Like, we don't know what the answers are. Uh, and so when that happens, you know, it's really unfortunate, but a lot of times there are efforts, I think, on the media to connect with these people, and um, if they don't connect back, that, that I feel like that puts them at a disadvantage for their campaigns. We'll go here. Yes. Okay. My question is very basic. My name is Derek Ward from Mr. Davenport's class. Uh, she talked about contract uh, journalists. I don't know too much about contract journalists, and you're saying how one had many contracts. Uh, can you just give me? Oh, I thought oh, you were referring to the lobbyists. lobbyists. Yeah, the lobbyists. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, so yeah, a lot. So let's say each of us represents um, a, a company or an industry or something like that. So I'm, I'm I get oil and gas. Your oil. Or, so you're you're Chesapeake and and you're um, Walmart and I'll be the optometric association of, association of optometric physicians and you can be the teachers union and who do you want to be, Laura? 
um, the road pavers, you know, somebody right. who's in the <laughs> so, each, so before the legislative session, each of those interests is going to go out and, and put on contract with a retainer and say, here's your $5,000 fee a month to uh, track legislation related to this topic. So Walmart might be interested in a lot of things. Walmart's actually very interested in optometry um, because in other states they can actually have optometrists there and, and, and make glasses on site. Oklahoma, you can't. Um, Walmart's interested in the retail liquor uh, situation. Walmart's interested in many things, right? Uh, so the oil and gas industry, they have very in many interests in terms of taxes and drilling rights and earthquakes. And we hate wind. Yeah, who are you? You're the teachers union. You want to raise. Who are you? And road pavers. Road so pavers. So you want, right, so you don't, you're, you're kind of concerned that if this foreign education tax passes and changes the way funding goes, that there won't be enough money for roads and bridges. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I want to just nothing to change because I'm an optometrist. I'm on the king. Yeah, you know, I'm King of Hill here. So you hire somebody to represent you and track bills that might affect you. And so when I say contract lobbyist, there's there's many contract lobbyists. And 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 if I let's say now James is the contract lobbyist, he might have uh, the road pavers and the teachers union because they're not really going to conflict. Maybe I mean maybe they will, maybe they won't. But you might have five to ten clients as a lobbyist who each pay different things. One small aside is that it's actually fairly well known that some lobbyists will sometimes, let's say I'm the optometrist, right? And and I don't hear any, the bills are about to be filed, the deadline, and I don't know anybody's gonna do anything affecting optometry. Well, I still want my $5,000 retainer, right? So I'm gonna go over to, uh, what was your name, Derek? Yeah. So Derek's an elected official here, he's a state senator, and we got a pretty good relationship. We hang out, we go to juniors, have a couple drinks, right? Occasionally, you know, look at women. All right, whatever we do. <laughs> It's not me being a pig. I'm just we're pretending we're the legislator. Right. I'm an optometrist here. You're a legislator, right? Uh, legislators are pigs. Um, so the uh, so I'm going to say, hey, Derek, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you file a bill that we know is not going to go anywhere, and you just file it, uh, and don't tell anybody who you know told you about it. And here's five thousand dollars for here's a thousand dollars for your campaign coming up, and you just file that bill and make sure it gets up there. And why don't you try to get it to get a hearing? Okay, so you're going to go do that. So on my request, because I want to keep the optometrist paying me five thousand dollars to have a job at the Capitol. So I don't know where that came from, but I, but that doesn't always happen. But those sorts of things do happen behind the scenes. And I think you were concerned about when uh, someone in that kind of position, the lobbyist, oh, is right. then brought on with uh, as a consultant or a, a government political analysis. Political. Right. Yeah. So right though I, there was a guy I referred to who's a very nice guy. I mean most I actually if you're a journalist and you want to get information at the state capitol, don't go talk to legislators. Talk to lobbyists because most of them have A been legislators before uh, and they're termed out so they go and they lobby and they've been up there for 20, 30 years and they're only good at lobbying because they're charming and they know how to hang out with you and they can, you know, shake your hand and pat you on the back and then go do the same thing with somebody else, right? So lob lobbyists are very valuable to, to interact with. I have some very good friends who are major lobbyists. Um, and, but it took me a year of covering the Capitol to figure that out because I was always trying to go talk to legislators and they're, and they're like weird and they don't know how to, you know, they don't want to talk to the media and they're, you know, they don't know what's going on. They've only been there for four years. And so lobbyists are very uh, useful in that regard in terms of information because they control a lot of what's going on out there. Uh, but but it, I think it's highly unethical for a for a publication or a news site to to run something from that person without uh, or put them up as a, a, a an analyst without disclosing who they are paid to rep at that point. Yeah. Disclosure is a big deal. I mean today just talking about clickbait if you go to the Yahoo front page there's a lot of those articles and there's a very very light gray sponsor. And you'll think, oh, uh, Warren Buffett's guy says that the world is ending in an economic fervor. And it says sponsored, but a lot of people will click on that. Oh, Warren Buffett's saying something about the world ending. So you, what's, we're coming into an age where people have to start watching their news judgment. Because we've a few years back, 10 years ago, there was a big way called video news releases. Oh, and wow. it got, I, yeah, I, I, you remember <laughs> video news releases? Barely. And these were basically stories that were created by lobbyists or created by some outfit that wanted to put their point across. And they would offer them to t television stations or radio stations if it was audio. And 
radio and television stations would play them like they, they were sourced within that station. It created a big deal. The FCC got involved. The FTC got involved. I think the FBI and DOJ got involved. And now, if you use anything that you didn't produce as a radio or television station, you better cite the source. Because the FCC can come down and find you more than they can find using the F word on the air. <laughs> but websites don't have that same type of regulation because you know, the sponsor well, didn't Facebook, interest. I think, has brought that to oh, be a yeah. huge problem where people just click on it and they think it's a real story. And, you know, Rick Roll. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you really have to look at the bottom left and see where that URL came from. I mean, that's so important. I see people do all the time by posting some just hack job blog that says, like, Bernie Sanders, you know, lied on his tech or whatever it might Justin be. Justin Timberlake said it and women are the best. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Do you have a question up here? Sorry. Yeah, just a quick question for uh, Mr. Doyle. Um, I know that you said that, uh, you know, that should have been a Watching the news stations, obviously, are kind of whistleblower issues. And um, if you go into the uh, articles and all that to find the deeper mm -hmm. uh, root of the issue, but um, which news station would you say is the most accurate and maybe kind of dives in a little bit deeper than the more broad? Not before you answer, yeah. 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 Before you answer, whoever's live tweeting this, just make sure you at the news station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guess what? I may never work in television again. Uh, also, main station. I, you know, to be honest with you, I think the thing with local television isn't so much that they have a bias or who's the most accurate or whatever, because a lot of it is controlled chaos. When you get into that newsroom, you only have maybe three reporters for three newscasts. Uh, you've got maybe an assistant producer that's jumping back and forth and helping out the main producers for newscasts, writing and, and gathering news. So the decisions have to come out like this. Uh, the stories also have to come out like this. And if you've got, and Oklahoma is a transitional market. Oklahoma City is, a, is big enough that we look like we're a major market when it comes to broadcast. We have some great broadcasters out there. However, we're also a stepping stone. We're training ground for them to go on to bigger markets. So we lose that into institutional knowledge a lot. And so you may get stories that seem biased, but really they're ignorant. Um, and I would say the only way you're combating that, because I see it on all four of the news channels, um, the only way you can really combat that is to do the research and go a little bit deeper and find it. Um, naming names as far as who does a great job, uh, Bill Cross from uh, Fox 25 does some great investigative pieces. Uh, he does get a little excited from time to time. <laughs> so, you know. Um, Make some Twitter Aaron, statements that are a bit odd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aaron uh, Brillback, uh, I think, is a great addition to KWTV9. I just wish the producers there would start producing packages at 10 p.m. when I actually consume that type of news at night because I'm on the air at 5 and 6, so I can't see what he's saying. Um, I think when it comes to human interest stories, you see Channel 4 do really well on that. And as far as covering breaking news, Channel 5 is probably the best to getting the steam and getting the basic information. Uh, they will stand in the dark parking lot yes. for all hours of the night to be live from that dark parking lot where news happened six hours earlier. So <laughs> they will do it. Uh, it's yes, they will. Yes, we will. I work for KOC. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but also behind the scenes, are always you know they're yelling at the porch. Think of an active stand up. You've got to do something. So oh, here on this uh, digital device, you heard this. You know, it, it's it's difficult because. You're up against a daily deadline, and like uh, in a, with radio, it used to be every half hour we had deadlines. Um, and it's the type of information that comes out when it comes out, because you've got a stagnant 5, 6, and 10 morning shows, that type of thing. If the news happens, if that breaking news happens at 4.30, especially if it happens at the Capitol or something that's an in-depth type of a story, you're not going to get a very good, you're going to get the press release what you're really going to get. Press release to some video uh, until they can break it down. And that's if the next breaking news story doesn't happen, they get called off the story. Um, just be a good news consumer and remember that they're human too. They're trying to make a living. Um, they're not trying to intentionally mislead anybody for the most part. Um, but overall, I think we've just got a dearth of political reporters in the broadcast realm. 
hearing no more. So. Thank you. Yeah. Was anybody else going to add? I was going to say that's like for non broadcast, um, <laughs> OklahomaWatch.org is a great resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really important what he said about News 9 with, with Aaron Drillbeck at the state capitol. Uh, even though I think sometimes he's hamstrung because he's trying to cover three things or he's trying to boil down the new liquor law proposal in uh, 80 seconds, which if you've ever tried to do that is really hard. He, he's, I know he, he's got 25 years experience. He's a really good guy. I don't frankly meet a whole lot of people in DP News who I think are really super sharp people. Yeah, that's why you and I got along, yeah. right? Because I thought you were. Um, little did I know. Uh, <laughs> little did you know. <laughs> no, but I, it's really important what Brillbeck's doing. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because, you know, he's at the Capitol every day. He's the only everyday Capitol yeah, reporter OETA TV can't out there. OETA can't do it anymore. Um, but even then, they're not a commercial station that's making the choice. Hopefully, other people will follow suit. Keaton Fox from Fox 25 does a really good job as well, along with Bill. Um, and, but Aaron's in a really interesting position because News 9 is the only locally owned station here. They're Griffin Communications out of Tulsa, um, their sister station, News on 6 up there. But uh, when, I, when we were out there in 08, 09, I, I forget which year it was, there, they were there doing the they were doing tort reform. I think it was 09. Oh, yeah, tort reform. So, tor so tort that. reform was like a... So it was a huge issue, and it and I covered the Senate kind of, and I worked for a weird station or a weird publication where we really mostly tracked the votes and had to do all this because lobbyists were our clients and everything. It was very weird, state agencies. Uh, but I learned a ton doing it. But so we're out, so we're out there, and I somehow get to go to the pro tems, the head of the Senate's press availability and everything like that. And there's a TV guy in there, and he was from News Nine, and he walked in, and he asked this question that was just so ignorant as if this hadn't already happened. Like, this was the after the bill has passed and gone to the governor press conference. And he's at talking about it as if it's still, like, live. You know, well, it was embarrassed. Everybody was just kind of like, oh, God, feel really, you, you know, in your room, you feel bad for somebody. But everybody was there. They just thought, that's what's going So we walk out, and I'm going, I've got a donut or something, and I'm turning the corner, and there's this guy. And he's sitting on a bench, and he's got about 800 pages in his hands. And he's like, Trace, what is this? And I said, well, that's the tort reform bill that they passed. And he's like looking through it and like, well, how do you read it? You know, and he like didn't know how to look. He was, out, he was sent out here to do a two minute story on tort reform. He gets, it was probably like 400 pages. He gets 400 pages of, of, of the bill and doesn't know that the underlying words are new words, that the new laws, and he didn't know how to look at it. And it was just, it was the saddest thing in my life. I tell that story to be very humorous. I like that guy very much, but the, the upgrade between that and what Aaron Brillbuck's doing now is enormous. And it's enormously important, not only for that station, but for the public. Well, and they expect you as a journalist to kind of be an expert in, in what you're covering. And, you know, you, you have to be an expert at jack of all trades and, and everything. And so it's, it's really difficult to, to do that. Well, sometimes it's best, I'd say, as a, I mean, we're just talking journalism now, I think it's sometimes best if you don't think you're an expert going into covering yeah. something. Um, one of the things I loved about journalism was my job literally every day is to get up and learn about something new mm -hmm. and learn about whether it's the oil and gas industry, wh whatever it might be. My job is to. Right, we're, we're trying to learn <laughs> something new. For non doc, I said Josh McPhee is our managing editor who uh, writes a lot our weekly legislative coverage. He, of all, the three main people involved on the site, has the least experience with the legislature by far. He, it, it, so it, it may take him a little longer, but it's actually very interesting because you see him, I get to see him research this stuff and figure it out and try to really get down to what's accurate because he's not out there with a lot of preconceived notions and ideas of it, and it forces him to, to do a really good job, and I think he does. I think we've got time for one more quick question and quick answer. I'm going to go here and go ahead. He's been waiting patiently. Um, you said that when they released, oh, my name's Clayton Colley, by the way. Uh, you said when they released those news media reels to you guys that the FCC and the DOJ kind of stepped in. Um, and you're talking about the lobbyists who are pretending, or not pretending, but are saying they're, uh, what do you call it? Experts on the point, do you think that maybe there should be more government intervention to kind of stop sponsored content, kind of stop these lobbyists from being 
No, I, I don't. I think it's already happened. I think that that's a past issue that you're. Whenever we get sent those type of materials, at least in the broadcast arena, they almost immediately go into file thirteen. Um, for for you young folks, that's the trash can. Uh, but uh, it's it really is no longer kind of an issue because now with the way digital technology has unfolded itself. There's all kinds of resources you can now grab to fill out the newscast that are safe to use because uh, you'll have a lot of the TV stations or CNN affiliates. So there's a lot of CNN video to be able to use and share. Uh, with my experience with KOCO, we had uh, all the first stations that we could share with as well. So ownership, network affiliation, that helps out a lot now. And the transport, uh, transport, transport portability of, of video. Is, has gotten to the point where you're no longer. When I got on the internet, it took 30 minutes to download a JPEG. <laughs> now, if it takes 30 minutes to do anything on the internet, people are, you know, they, they give up. But now it's just so easy to transport that stuff that it's no longer an issue. And it really kind of, those things, when they show up, they just get put, pushed aside. And it's the job of each individual publication to have an editorial policy that says, okay, we'll have Bobby Stim on the air, but you know, we're going to make sure ahead of time that we're not talking about something he has a financial stake in. And also, we're going to disclose that we have thought that through and talked about that before we start the interview. And I think that also stems from taking an ethics course when you're studying journalism or mass communication. It, it, it's very important. All right. I want to thank our panelists again. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't you? ask. Go ahead. We, 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 Are you sure? It's we have the same got, title, so I really like it. <laughs> so. Well, my question is actually for you. I'm Kelsey Morgan, by the way. I'm the editor of 15th Street News. And uh, Jason Doyle kind of talked a little bit about how um, younger journalists don't really know a lot about, and they don't really dig deep. They don't do a lot of classic journalism. And then you talked about how with Nondoc, you kind of do different writing. You do different writing styles, like you talked about. Um, at campaign rallies, doing uh, writing about behind the scenes. Well, I mean, right now I'm learning news shouldn't be the news. So why would readers care about what's going on behind the scenes with like media? Sure. Well, I mean, because I think it's the the most accurate. I think I think to cover the legislature and ignore the lobbyists in the rotunda is to to only tell a part of the picture. I think to cover a campaign and not talk about how the campaigns are trying to spin the narratives in their direction is is not accurate or helpful. I think that's why you end up with somebody like Trump being so successful or conversely somebody like Bernie Sanders being so successful. I mean, you know, I don't want to cause a big stir, but neither of those candidates has very much depth to their policy proposals. Um, I, I mean, I'm on a college campus, I don't want to get shot for saying that Bernie Sanders <laughs> you know, have a But I get, can't get shot. Uh, this is turning into a train wreck. I'm making the same thing. You'll get saying. a free education. But, You'll get a free education. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and even in putting that stuff out, like, the numbers don't really add up, and nobody cares, and nobody talks about, like, well, that's kind of what everybody does, right? Like, that, that's the, that this is that, that on a campaign, every campaign has people directly intended to try to play media to try to create policy numbers to give to media, to assuage the questions you're going to get. So I think it's important to look at it in real terms and not pretend like, like the campaign element of it is, is the, the, the front office of the Thunder. We don't talk about them when the game's going on because we're just focused on the game, right? I, I think that, that it's really important to talk about the financial element of it, the media element, all of those sorts of things. Before we get out of here, I have two things I need to do. Number one, uh, this panel has been uh, sponsored by a grant uh, from the uh, John Templeton Foundation that was administered through the Institute for Humane Studies. So we certainly want to thank our partners in, in providing resources to make this discussion possible. Uh, and we also have some gifts for our panelists. So, uh, Funding for Great Debates, budget, Power, so Politics, and People, to, provided to by the John Templeton Foundation. Through a grant from the Institute for Humane Studies. Facilities provided by Rose State College Professional Training Center.
fun. All right, you're graduating. Where are you going? Rose State starts you out with a choice from more than 60 degrees and certificate programs. 95% of recent Rose State graduates are employed. So what are you waiting for? Rose State College. Going somewhere starts here. All right, you're graduating.